Thank you, Jonathan, and thank you, uh, the Provost of the University. Actually, it was a great opening to uh, what I would like to uh, share with this uh, distinguished forum today. I would like to discuss the subject of uh, the definition of terrorism, and maybe uh, at least to clarify the way I see it and what it, it, what it really is. Is it, uh, is it a war situation? Is it a criminal act? And so on and so forth. In, 1940, in 1984, 23 years ago, a young student, very thrilled and anxious student, on the second year of the bachelor degree, was standing in the uh, Ben Gurion Airport, waiting to meet, first time ever, a distinguished law professor from McGill University. And he was meeting him in order to show him the first draft of the first article that he ever wrote about the definition of terrorism. The young student was myself, and the distinguished professor was Professor Erwin Kotler. And uh, the first article which I wrote back then, 23 years ago, about the definition of terrorism, actually I'm going to repeat the, basic of, uh, the basics of this uh, uh, article, of course, with a little bit uh, different approach and different views. But I do have to say that maybe the only person at that time that backed up this initiative was Professor Erwin Kotler, against all odds and against the major uh, concepts of the academic world and the political world, and legal advisors and so on and so forth. At that time, if there was something that scholars, legal advisors, decision makers really uh, uh, agreed upon in reference to the definition of terrorism was that first, and, first of all, there is no way to achieve an objective accepted international definition of the term. And second, there is no need to do so because we can fight terrorism without defining that. We can fight terrorism just by defining the uh, bad deeds that they are doing. They kill, they arson, they extort, they hijack. We can outlaw these activities and that's it. At that time, I was arguing that you cannot fight effectively terrorism without agreeing upon one definition. What is terrorism all about? And what was true then, I think, becomes a necessity these days. I would like to argue that today we cannot fight the, fun, the, the fundraising activity of the terrorist organization without defining terrorism. We cannot fight the incitement process, the radicalization process, the propaganda to terrorism without defining terrorism. We cannot, we cannot outlaw terrorist organization without defining terrorism. And therefore, from my point of view, a definition of terrorism is a precondition for effective international counterterrorism. If you would ask President Assad today if he's against terrorism, he would say that he is. If you would ask uh, um, Nasrallah if he's against terrorism, he would argue that he is. And if you would ask Bin Laden if he's against terrorism, he would swear that he's against terrorism. Why not? Everybody holds his own definition, and therefore everybody could be at the same time a terrorist and define himself as a person who uh, denied terrorism, who is against terrorism altogether. The problem is not that there is no definitions for terrorism. The problem is just the opposite. There are hundreds of definitions of terrorism. There is the early book, which I'm, I'm sure the scholars here are familiar with the book of uh, Schmidt, Political Terrorism at the 70s was written. And back then, there was uh, 109, and Jungmann, we have... Uh, him uh, as well. Uh, back then there were 109 definitions. So the problem is not that you don't have definitions altogether. The first question we, when we are trying to define terrorism that we have to ask ourselves is in what realm are we staying? Are we in a war realm, a war situation, or this is a criminal realm? And here I beg to differ with General Clark uh, um, lecture from yesterday. Actually, it's not a real differing from, from his point of view because I would argue that the terrorist lies at the same time in both realms. At the realm of uh, 
the criminal activity and the realm of uh, uh, warfare. But in order to comprehend the phenomenon of terrorism, we have to start our discussion from the realm of a war situation. And I would argue that terrorism is a war, although, as I said, terrorists are doing the same thing that criminals do. Terrorism is a war situation because terrorism is much more dangerous to the safety and the welfare and the, and the security of the world. Terrorism is posing a great threat to all democracies worldwide and all civilized world altogether. And frankly, right now, we don't have to defend the term warfare when we refer to uh, terrorism because leave uh, for one minute President Bush defining that as a, as a war situation because many doesn't agree with him. But NATO, after 9-11, was uh, um, applying Article Number 5 of its covenant and referring to the attack on the United States as an armed attack, which is a war, a war situation. The Security Council in September 2001 referred to the attack on the United States as a threat to the peace and the security of the world. Israel is using the term armed conflict short of war. This is a new term in a way, but still in the realm of a war. So, when we refer to a situation of a war, we have the symmetric warfare and we have the asymmetric warfare. The symmetric warfare is a war between states. That's what we used to see for many years altogether, and all the uh, uh, laws of war are referring to this type of war between states. But I find this ridiculous. And I see this as a paradox, that the uh, normative restrictions that states has at times of war does not apply to sub-states, to a non-state actor. They are not forced to, to, uh, to uh, uh, obey the same restrictions. So in a war between states, we see that the Geneva Conventions and uh, other uh, international law differ between warriors, people that are engaged in military operation, part of, uh, of uh, uh, a regular army, and so on and so forth, and war criminals. Of course, there are different reasons to define a person that, which is engaged in the battlefield as a war criminal, but I would refer to maybe the most important uh, consideration. A military personnel, a soldier, that deliberately attacks civilians become a war criminal by this definition. And this is already accepted by most of the states of the world. So we don't invent anything new. We don't invent any new normative laws. We just refer to what is already accepted by Arab countries, by Muslim countries, by civilized world, by third world countries, and so on and so forth. And I would argue that we should apply the same concept on an asymmetric warfare and therefore differ between terrorists, terrorism, and guerrilla warfare, which is the equivalent of military operation in this respect. The definition that I recommend to use is short, precise, objective as possible, and even has the concept of reciprocity between the two sides, the states and the non-state actor which is terrorism, is the deliberate use of violence aimed against civilians. Civilians, not innocent, not non-combatants, civilians, in order to achieve political ends. Terrorism always have a political end. The political end could be various ends. It could be religious goals that they are trying to achieve, uh, extreme ideology, anarchism, communism, fascism, they could be freedom fighting. They could, fight, they could fight for the freedom. They could be revolutionaries trying to change the regime in their country. From my point of view, the essence of the political goal is much less important than the tactic that they use. And terrorism is a tactic. Terrorism is a modus operandi. Terrorism is an effective modus operandi to achieve political goals, any political goals. And we suffer from terrorism because it's effective. There are some problems 
in this definition, and I will, I will be the first one to admit that, but I believe that this definition is giving us some order in this chaotic situation of defining terrorism. The American definition is, uh, I'm referring to the State Department because the Americans have de many definitions altogether, but the State Department definition says that terrorism is the deliberate use of violence aimed against non-combatants, which means also soldiers which are not in the battlefield situation. From the point of view of the Americans, an attack against the American warship, the call in Yemen, this is terrorism, not in my view. An attack against the American soldiers' residence in Iraq, it's terrorism, not in my view. An attack against an Israeli soldier in Gaza, it's not terrorism in my view, it's guerrilla warfare. An attack against Israeli soldier who is hitchhiking on the way to his base, it's not terrorism, it's guerrilla warfare. I'm not saying that guerrilla warfare is, the, uh, uh, is something that I have to live with. Anyone who deliberately attack my soldiers is my enemy. And I have all the right in the world to fight against him and to kill him. But I do say that there is a normative difference in the legitimacy of those two acts. If you deliberately attack civilians, this is totally different than deliberate attack against military personnel. But not only the Americans are trying to, uh, to uh, broaden the definition in a way or to, to uh, uh, pull the blanket in a way that will cover the, the body. The other side is doing the same. Let me quote a pamphlet that the Muslim World League was presenting on the definition of terrorism in 2001 in Durban meeting. My definition holds one sentence. They had three pages of a definition, so I will not read all the three pages. Just let me read the opening of that. Terrorism is an outrageous attack carried out either by individuals, groups, or states against the human being, and now listen to that, against his religion, his life, his intellect, if you insult my intellect, this is, a, this is a terrorism by that definition, against his property, against, against his honor, and so on and so forth. It includes all forms of intimidation, harm, threatening, killing, now the punchline, without a just cause. So if you have a just cause, all of the above is okay. You can kill, you can insult, you can harm, you can do all of the above, because you have a, you have a, a, a just cause. My friends, we would never agree upon what is a just cause and what is not a just cause. But we can agree upon what is tactic which should be always prohibited. And that's the deliberate use of violence aimed against civilians. Even if you have a holy cause, you are not allowed to use the deliberate attacks of violence aimed against civilians. The problem is that many are confusing between ends, the goals, and the tactics. And you all are familiar with the term, one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter, which sounds very good, because what it tells us, which is kind of true, is anyone who fights against me is a terrorist, but anyone who fights against my enemy in doing the same thing is a freedom fighter. The message that is being sent in this slogan is that terrorism, or the definition of terrorism, is a subjective term. I beg to differ. It's an objective term, and we should not refer to that as a subjective term. There are many problems in, in the definition that I uh, present. Many uh, would say, and I had this coming from uh, Israeli Defense Force, oh my God, what are you saying? If, if that's true, then people will say that Israel is a terrorist state because many Palestinians, civilians are being killed or hurt. I'm a product of the Israeli Defense Force. I was taught and raised as a soldier, as an officer at the Israeli Defense Force. And I was taught sometimes to risk my life in order to defend the enemy civilians. And if there is an Israeli soldier, God forbid, that deliberately attacks civilians, he should be prosecuted. By the way, no, it's not me who's saying that. It's not the definition that I suggest to saying that. This is the laws of war. You don't need to define terrorism in order to uh, uh, prosecute member of military personnel that deliberately attack civilians. But I'm saying let's use the same terms and the same normative perspective uh, when we refer to substates as well. Some says, wait a minute, come on, this is just lip service what you're saying. 
Because there is no one organization in the world who is actually a pure terrorist organization or a pure guerrilla organization. All the terrorist organizations are doing both. They are attacking civilians and they are attacking military personnel. Take Hezbollah, Hamas, Al-Qaeda, you name it. True. Why should they focus in one uh, 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 target? Why should they attack just civilians and not military personnel? Because if Israel will capture tomorrow morning a Palestinian terrorist that deliberately attack a kindergarten and a Palestinian guerrilla warrior that deliberately attack an Israeli military barricade, he will be prosecuted in the same way. He will get the same punishment. He will, same, he will get the same illegitimacy. In a nutshell, I would say this is another lecture. I would not even prosecute anyone that deliberately attack military personnel. Any Palestinian that deliberately attack our soldiers, when I capture him, I would put him in a POW camp, prisoners of war. I would not bring him to trial. He will stay there until we'll have peace with our enemy, Hamas, Hezbollah, or whoever, or until we will have prisoners exchange. The Israeli government tried to uh, set red lines time and again by saying we are not going to free Hamas members in exchange of our soldiers. We are not going to free anyone that has blood on his hands. Nonsense. If it was not ICT, I would say bullshit. We time and again find ourselves whitening those red lines. Why? Because it doesn't hold water. The only red line that I would put would be, is this person engaged in terrorist act? or in a guerrilla warfare? Did he deliberately attack civilians or military personnel? If he deliberately attacked military personnel, he is a person that I would free him in, in return, in exchange of our soldiers, regardless if he killed, if he arson, or he had just, just an intention to do so. If he deliberately attacked civilians, he should rotten in jail until he serve all his sentence. But it's not only the terrorists who are doing this, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, trying to, uh, to broaden the definition of terrorism. Let me quote Senator Henry Jackson in 1987, who's saying the following, the thought that one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter is unacceptable. Freedom fighters or revolutionaries do not blow up buses without non-combatants. Terrorists and murderers do. Freedom fighters do not kidnap and slaughter students. Terrorists and murderers do. Excuse me. Freedom fighters are doing all of the above as terrorists because freedom fighting is a goal and terrorism is a tactic to achieve the goal. And once you are uh, having a goal of being a freedom fighter, you try to free your country, you have to decide what is the tactic that you are using in order to achieve this goal. Is it terrorism or guerrilla warfare? And uh, I would dare to say that if the international community would accept this definition, you would see many terrorist organizations changing their consideration and, the, and the deciding to focus on guerrilla warfare and not terrorism. There is a question, what would happen when a terrorist organization is involved in the political rearm of a state. We saw many cases where terrorist organizations developed a political arm and at first were active in the municipal level of the state. I would argue that in this case the terrorist organization does not lose his uh, notorious definition as a terrorist organization. He has a, a political arm by all means, but it doesn't mean that you should refer to that organization differently than you used to. The only problem is that you should refer to the state or the entity that led this organization to be active in their political realm as a state that sponsored terrorism. Because by letting him or letting the organization be active in the municipal and then maybe in the uh, parliament and then maybe even in a coalition, they actually are legitimizing the terrorist organization and by being an, a political actor, he gained also resources from the state. And therefore, from uh, um, my argument is that a political arm does not rehabilitate the terrorist organization. 
with one exception. If a terrorist organization decides to abandon terrorism, to close the terrorist organization, and to be active only in the political arena, this is, in my view, a counter-terrorism success. This is, in my view, a goal that we all should try to achieve. It doesn't mean, I told you there was going to be rain. First rain in Israel this season. <laughs> I would argue that uh, we should support such an initiative. We should see to it that a terrorist organization or the terrorist that decides to abandon terrorism and to focus in the political arena, they should uh, uh, be supported. Of course, on a personal level, they are still responsible for the atrocities that they did. And there is a question, if, when, and how you rehabilitate those people on a personal level, but the entity is being rehabilitated. The problem is, when a terrorist organization is taking over a political entity, and does not abandon terrorism. Actually, it changes the whole entity into a terrorist entity. This is a terrorism state and should be referred as a terrorist state. <laughs> Last but not least, what about the definition of a state that involves in terrorism? Today, we call to all of these types of involvement in terrorism under the definition state that sponsored terrorism. I beg to differ, and I would like to suggest uh, a different classification. The classification would be as follows. You see different level of activities, different level of involvement in terrorism. Uh, a, a state that supports a terrorist organization by inciting, by uh, uh, launching propaganda. A state that gives financial support, a state that gives military support, and then operational support. All of the above, in my view, defines the state as a state that sponsors terrorism. But there is a higher layer of involvement in terrorism. A state that initiates terrorist activity and directs the attack. In this case, we are not dealing with a state that sponsors terrorism. We deal with a state that initiates terrorism. This is a higher level of involvement in the terrorism realm. We have another layer, which is higher, and this is a state that uses proxies in order to launch terrorist attacks. The difference between the latter and this one is that states that use proxies are actually uses these, using these proxies in order to commit attacks to support the activity and the goals of the state, not the organization. For example, Iran using proxies in order to kill political opponents, dissidents, and so on and so forth, I would refer to this state as a state that operates terrorism. The highest level of involvement on, in terrorism is a state that uses its own apparatuses, intelligence apparatuses, military apparatuses, in order to deliberately kill civilians as a policy of the state. This is a terrorism state. To conclude that, let's take Iran for example. I would like to, to say that Iran represents a state that it's in the highest level of involvement in terrorism. By the way, when you are at the peak of the pyramid, you are actually doing all of the layers together. The lowest layer, Iran is involved in sponsoring terrorism, giving military support, giving training, weapons, giving financial support to Hamas. Therefore, Iran is a, terror is a terrorism state that sponsors terrorism. But Iran also initiates terrorist acts. They are pushing their, uh, uh, the terrorist organization to launch terrorist attacks. For example, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, for that matter, sometimes even Hamas. Therefore, I would argue that Iran is also a terrorism initiating state. But Iran is also involved in uh, killing or using proxies in order to kill this, uh, Iranian dissidents and they are using proxies to promote the goals of the states. For example, Hezbollah for that matter. Therefore, Iran is also a terrorism operating state. And Iran also wins this notorious position of being a terrorist state 
and we just saw the designation of the Revolutionary Guard and uh, maybe in the future the, mi the Ministry of Intelligence of Iran by being involved in committing those terrorist attacks. So to sum up, my friends, I do believe that we have to take the definition of terrorism as one of our main goals and in this forum and other forum discuss this freely and openly and find way to agree upon one definition and by that to, uh, uh, to support and to make international counterterrorism much more efficient. Thank you very much.